Okay. Okay, great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And thanks for joining us again for another virtual event. And uh, today we're delighted to have Fiona Davis back with us. She's going to be talking about her brand new book, The Spectacular. And she has signed a bunch of books for us. And our copies also come with this very cool uh, insert here. Yeah. And there's a story behind it that Fiona can tell you about. Who is the woman on the insert? Her name is Sandy. And when I was starting to think about where to set my next book, I actually got an email through my author website. And it was this woman. She said, I'm in my mid-80s. I'm a former Rockette. And if you want to know the secrets of Radio City Music Hall, you should call me. Now, <laughs> she knew I set my books in iconic New York City buildings, so I could not resist. And we had this marvelous conversation at the time she lived in South Carolina. And she, she just had all these vivid memories about being a Rockette that were just so, so interesting. And, and she spoke with such joy about her time at dancing on that stage, which was from the late 50s to early 60s. And I just thought, you know, there could be a story here. And there is, which is what we're going to find in the spectacular. Sorry, Patrick, finish your speech and then we'll take off. Oh, my, my, my speech is just if you have questions for Fiona, go ahead and put them in the comments or the chat feature here. And I'll be happy to ask any that you might have. So and I'm going to put a buy link in the comments. Yes, I'm sorry. I'll put Great. a buy link as well for the signed copies. We don't have very many left, so jump on them. Right, okay. indeed, although we probably could get more. So Fiona, yeah. I am actually a person who has been to Radio City Music Hall in the time frame of this book. When I was young, I was the oldest granddaughter. And so my grandmother wanted to go to Europe in 1955. And so I was elected to go with her. And we sailed over on the old Queen Mary and came back on the old Queen Elizabeth. That's a potential story for you about the big ships and, oh. you know, and the docks in New York and so forth. But anyway, because we had a couple of days in New York, she took me to the Rainbow Room for lunch, which I have to tell you in the 1950s, it was like the Stork Club was one of those really glamorous. I mean, you know, I'm a little girl from suburban Chicago. So I thought it was unbelievably cool to be up there at Rockefeller Center in the Rainbow Room. Um, Unfortunately, we were not able to go and see the Rockettes, but, um, you know, they were also an epitome of glamour and New York. Maybe, I don't know, maybe more for tourists than locals. What do you think? No, I, I've heard from so many New Yorkers who say, just like you, one of their early memories is going to Radio City Music Hall or, or seeing the Rockettes or, and, and you know, they're they're just as excited and, and they bring back their kids and their grandkids every year. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry that I've never actually seen the Rockettes, um, but who of us doesn't know about them and particularly their fabulous Christmas shows, which, you know, are legendary. My husband grew up on Park Avenue. Um, and so I've never asked him. I wonder if he actually has been to one I'm, of the Rockette shows. Yeah, yeah. He might have been dragged to one against Kiki. He might. Himself. No, I, I will inquire. I mean, there are a whole lot, especially in the 50s. There was all this sort of glamour and glamour spots to New York. Very oh, yeah. big, you know, for incoming tourists and so forth. And, um, and that was a more formal age. I mean, yeah. that's people actually got dressed up to go on airplanes and didn't wear their pajamas. And, um, you know, you wouldn't have dreamt to going to go out to dinner or to any kind of a, a formal, uh, not so much a formal, but a an evening event. You wouldn't have dreamt of going to the Metropolitan Opera without. Speaking of which, I have I have a thought for you about the Met, but we'll get to that. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, it was just, it was a different age, and it was a far more formal age. And um, at that same trip, when we were in Paris, we went to the Folie Bergère, which, of course, you know, I thought was going to be unbelievably sexy and scandalous and all. And it really wasn't. Um, <laughs> wasn't like the Moulin Rouge under Toulouse uh, track or anything. Right. right. But there yeah. again, you know, it was... Um, um, people weren't nearly as daring, at least publicly. And so right. you got to see women dancing in scanty costumes and doing stuff and all. It was um, more of a, it was more unusual, let me put it that way, and more thrilling than today when you could watch TikTok and who cares? 
<laughs> oh no, that's right. That's why it's fun to write about the past because it was yeah. it really was so different. And in fact, speaking of um, you know crossing the ocean, the Radio City was was created and built by a guy named S. L. Rothfeld, known as Roxy. Mm-hmm. And you know, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of the stage, but it's this beautiful stage in this enormous oval, you know, right. theater. And then there's these proscenium arches that radiate out from the stage, and they're lit in red, yellow, and orange to mimic a sunrise that Roxy saw on a transatlantic crossing. And his idea was to make the theater look like that sunrise that he saw from the ship as he was crossing the the ocean. You can kind of see it in the cover. Yeah, that's the exterior and the interior. It's really, really a beautiful, beautiful theater. It's all art deco. And and yeah, like you said, it's really classy. It's it's stunning. I have it on my my list when I go to New York next time. Um, all of our travels were interrupted there for so long, but happily everybody is. And I've tried to dodge revenge travel because, you know, it just makes it crowded, but we're starting to travel again. And yeah. Would, yeah. Anyway, um, so the idea for this story was not, it came to you from a conversation with somebody who actually was at Red Yeah. That's- and so it was amazing. And so I started digging into the history and, you know, right now, Radio City is a concert venue. You see bands there, there's a board show, there's comedians. But back then, it was a movie theater. Right. And it showed four shows a day. And if you bought a ticket to the movie, you also got a ticket to the stage show that they would show in between. And that would involve the Rockettes. It involved the Radio City Ballet Corps, believe it or not. There was a choral ensemble that would perform. And there was they'd bring on, like, jugglers or entertainers. And um, and so it was very different from what it was today. And today, if you're a Rockette, like you said, you do the Christmas show and that's very seasonal. But back then it was a full-time job and you danced four shows a day for three or four weeks straight. And then you'd get a week off. Wow. And so it was intense. And, and each, each performance was kind of connected to the movie that was being shown. So say it was a John Wayne movie, they'd do kind of a cowboy theme. Mm-hmm. And that meant that whenever there was a new movie coming in, and I think there were like 700 premieres at Radio City over the years, including King Kong and White Christmas and MAME. And so if they had a new show coming in, they'd have to learn the new number, which they would do in between the shows that they were already doing or in the morning or late at night. And so it was this incredibly difficult job. And they had a kick line in every dance number, which meant they did 600 kicks a day, which is a lot. So it was, it was oh. yeah, you had to be in tip top shape. You had to be the best of the best to be a rocket. Yeah. And I mean, your physical conditioning would have to be extraordinary. Did they last very long? I mean, that takes a real toll on your body. You know, I think eventually they might go off and go off and get married or have a family as it, my book takes place in the fifties. And so that was pretty common as you do it for a few years and then move on. But these days, you know, there are dancers who've been rockets for 10 years and they do it right into their thirties. Um, You know, back then it was really kind of 18 to 23, 25 was the average age of the Rockette. Well, that Um, makes perfectly good sense considering the physical conditioning and the stamina that, and also you wouldn't have much of a personal life if that was your work schedule. Yeah, my friend, my friend Sandy, who inspired me, she actually met her husband, Bob, when they were both 19, because he ran the lighting board at Radio City Music Hall, and they've been married ever since. I love it. Well, you know, there are lots of women who attracted admirers. Um, I mean, that's a very Victorian or sort of thing, you know, where women on stage attracted um, either husbands or maybe more often lovers who then, you know, supported them and so forth. So, yeah, it was. uh, But I've always thought it was more of a young person's game. But then, you know, the age thing has really changed dramatically in Mm -hmm. the last couple of decades as people have, you know, paid more attention to aging, you know, yeah. more physical conditioning, better diet, um, you know, the whole bit, not to mention actual rules about age discrimination, which There's that too. for employers, I, you know, it's an interesting thought. I wonder, I wonder if employers of something like the Rockettes are actually subject to the same discrimination rules as say, um, say my bookstore where, you know, we'd really be smacked if we let somebody go because we thought they'd aged out. Of course, in our case, I'm the oldest member of the team. It's <laughs> likely, but, but it could happen. 
I mean, it could. you know, what's so funny is that the Rockettes, just to show how things have changed over time, when it, when the group was formed in 1925, it was actually formed in, in St. Louis, Missouri. They were called the Missouri Rockets. Mm. And the H, the height requirement then was five, two to five, six and a half. And today it's five, five to five, ten and a half. So it shows you how people have grown over time. Yeah, well, no, that's for sure. I remember years and years, well, maybe even on that trip, going to Anne Hathaway's cottage in yeah. Shakespeare country. Yes. And I, who am barely five feet two, had to duck yes. under all the doorways because people were so small. In fact, I once saw one of Napoleon's uniforms at Malmaison, Josephine's home outside Paris. And he was like four foot eight. He was really tiny, you know, yeah. but that wasn't, that wasn't that unusual. No, no. I mean, things have changed in terms of health and diet, but what was really funny in terms of learning about this was talking to Rockettes because I talked to Sandy and then I met more and I, I spoke with more and more Rockettes. Some had been there in the forties, some fifties, sixties, yeah. and they all talked with such kind of um, energy and joy about what it was like to dance on that stage. because. You know, as we're talking in the 50s and 40s and 60s, women were supposed to be teachers or nurses or secretaries or wives. And yet here were these women who were living in New York City, making their own money, independent, free. And, and I remember talking to one and she, she talked about walking hand in hand with her fellow Rockettes down the middle of Fifth Avenue in the middle of the night, singing at the top of their lungs. You know, there was this, this, this kind of amazing independence that could be found there. And, and, you know, it was a real sisterhood. I asked, was there any, you know, backstabbing or anything like that behind the scenes? And they all said, no, it was a real sisterhood in many ways. And that's a real testament to the, the guy who founded it named Russell Marker, who, um, you know, was a really positive, wonderful father figure to all of them. And he retired eventually in 1971. And, and so it was just fun to learn, you know, fun little gems, like one Rockette talked about how the last show of the night, the conductor would always speed up so he could make his train home. And so they were left out there just kicking as fast as they could. Um, it was just really, you know, they weren't allowed to get suntans or sunburns if they weren't allowed to gain or lose weight. And it was really about illusion. You know, when you look at them, it looks like they're all the same person, really, with the same lipstick, same hair pulled back. But, you know, when they do say the kick line, the tallest girls are in the middle. And the shorter ones are at the end and the, all the hemlines are the same. And so it gives this illusion of them being all the same person. And the same with when, when they do the kick line, you know, it looks like their hands are behind each other's backs. But in fact, there's a few inches of distance between the hand of the girl and the back of the girl next to her. And I, I'm assuming that's so they do, if they wobbled, they wouldn't bring the whole, yeah. whole thing down. But it's all about illusion. And it takes such precision and strength and technique to be able to dance that way. And, and so that's where the kind of the idea for setting the book there came from. And the lead character in the book is called Marion. And she auditions to be a Rockette against the wishes of her father. And she's, she's a wonderful dancer, but she's actually based on a, an actress named Vera Ellen, mm -hmm. who was in White Christmas, because she was a Rockette when she was very young. But she couldn't fit in. Yeah, she could not fit in. If he wanted, a, if Russell Markert wanted a kick that was shoulder high, hers would be eye height. You know, she just was too, there was too much for her for the stage. And he gave her a couple of weeks to figure it out. And she eventually quit before she was fired and then went on to, you know, great success as an actress. And so my character has a similar issue of, of she's just bursting with energy and life. And the, the theme of the book is really, you know, what is the cost of suppressing your own individuality or your own creativity for the good of the common whole? You know, whether it's a dance team or a corporation or the community, you know, when do you work as a team and when do you need to step up and make your voice heard? And so Marion has that kind of comes into that as a as a individual in, in, in the course of the book to figure out kind of how to to go on. She's she's kind of faced with pretty dire circumstances. She is. You know, most of your books have had a bigger story in the aftermath, so to speak. But in this one, it's almost all in the in the time that Marion is um, a rockhead and there's a, a bit of a coda, but it's not nearly as significant as in some of your other, other stories. So Marion has to fight against her father who is 
domineering and very old school and wants her to become engaged to someone that Marion fears will be basically a company man, right? Like a sort of the IBM. And, you know, I remember that that in the, in the fifties, that was really kind of a dream, you know, is that, yeah, um, you'd go from high school or college, whatever it was, and you'd go into a job and you'd stay there. You know, you would rise through the corporate ranks and work towards retirement and all, but it was a very narrow white life. Try it again. Narrowly defined life. And the, the Rosie, the Riveter women who, you know, has worked so hard during World War II by then to a great degree had been relegated back to the sort of Donna Reed, you know, vacuuming a house and your crinoline, you know, and all the rest of it. And women, I don't think women were even allowed to wear pants in public in the many. I'm telling you, when I went to Stanford in 1958, we were not allowed to wear pants on campus. Yeah, I know at the Barbizon Hotel for Women up until I think the 70s, you weren't allowed to cross the lobby if you were wearing pants. You had to be oh. wearing a shirt. Yeah. So, I mean, that's hard for people to imagine now because it wasn't that long ago. But nonetheless, um, you know, and that's another question I thought that you brought out well in the book is where is an independent woman with her own money? Where is she actually going to live in New York City? You can't reasonably, given that schedule, it'd be very hard to commute any big distance, you know, finishing up late at night and who's looking after you. So where did women like that live? Career women. Yeah, you know, that was tricky because, you know, you couldn't get an apartment on your own. You would need a man to co-sign for it. And also, I think a lot of landlords wouldn't want a single female. They would assume the worst and think that you were immoral in some way. It was so different. And so a lot of the women went and stayed at a place called the Rehearsal Club, which was just on 53rd Street. So just a few blocks away from Radio City. And a number of Rockettes lived there. And it was this kind of boarding house for women in the performing arts. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the movie Stage Door Mm -hmm. with Andrew Rogers and Catherine Hepburn? That's set at at that boarding house. And, um, and, you know, there were a lot of rules. You had to, there was no alcohol, no smoking, no boys above the parlor room. Um, You had a midnight curfew. You had to be between 18 and 25 and neither married nor divorced. And you had to be pursuing a career in the performing arts, either taking classes or auditioning or performing. So it was really the perfect place for these Rockettes to stay. And some of the Rockettes who stayed there, or some of the the people who've stayed there include um, Carol Burnett, who, can you imagine rooming with Carol Burnett? That would have been so much fun. Um, Diane Keaton, Sandy Duncan, uh, Blythe Danner. And yeah, it was this, and it's recently been revitalized. There's kind of a new rehearsal club, not in the same location for, for women coming to New York and and needing a place to stay that's safe and, and where they're, you know, protected. And back then you got room and board, you got two meals a day during the week for, I think, $18 a week. Quite a bar. That's another thing that's really changed our, our prices, not to mention the cost of New York real estate. So what's the difference between a hotel like the Barbizon and the rehearsal club? Is it based more on, you know, work than it is on private life? Yeah, you know, the rehearsal club, you had to be in the arts. So it was full of people who were, you know, maybe opera singers or dancers or actors, um, you know, so it was very vibrant. And the Barbizon was much, much bigger because it was a huge skyscraper. So there you got, you know, the Ford models had a couple of floors there. The Katie Gibbs Secretarial School would put their students up there. And so it was a similar type of student. It's just that this one was more specialized and much smaller. Right. No, I mean, that makes perfectly good sense that, you know, they would have some. What What was something like that? I mean, here I'm revealing the fact that unlike my husband, I did not grow up on Park Avenue. So I'm sort of ignorant. What was the Chelsea Hotel? What's the difference between that and something like the Barbizon? Yeah, the Chelsea Hotel was co-ed. So it was open to both men and women. And that was more of it was similar. You know, it was a hotel where you could come in and just stay a couple nights but there were a number of long-term residents who stayed there yeah. as if it were the Barbizon Hotel, just, you know, and they lived there for decades even. And that was in a different area. It was down kind of near Chelsea. So it was a little further downtown and a little more arty and yeah. quirky with a lot of painters, um, a lot of political activists. Um, you know, the poet um, Dylan Thomas 
you know, drank all the, he drank like 37 whiskeys at the White Horse Tavern and then died at the Chelsea Hotel. So it's full of, you know, crazy ghosts of poets and things. Um, so it was just a little more, um, a little less regulated, I would say. That was, it was a bit, bit of a free for all to Chelsea in a good way. Right. But I knew part of it was residential. Actually, as I understand it, you could be residential at the plaza. You know, I don't know if you can still do it, but for um, certainly for a long time, possibly yeah. before Trump, um, you know, you could actually live at the plaza. I mean, now hotels are doing that, but what they're doing is they're largely creating standalone, you know, villas and stuff so that you can, we have a Ritz Carlton going in here. Where right, the so an area in the condo and yes. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, the Valley Ho next near the bookstore where so many authors say when they come to see us has a condo complex, you know, attached to the hotel. So I guess the idea is that you get the benefit of hotel services, but you have a private um, quarters. You're not in the hotel. Yeah. um, And I think, I think that you, I think you have to buy them, although I might be wrong. I'm, I'm not sure they're, maybe you can rent them, but I think a lot of them are actually for sale. Yeah, I, I know the Chelsea. Um, the Chelsea reopened under after a long renovation, and about forty of the longtime residents still live there. Um, but I, I think that is still just rental. You know, you. I don't think they bought their apartments. It's still rental, and and it's beautiful. If anyone ever wants to stop by, it's really, really gorgeous and beautifully done. And they kept the original details in a great way. So that's kind of exciting. The Barbizon, of course, now is all condo. Um, mm-hmm. Other. Yeah, well, there's on the fourth floor, there were about a dozen of the old time residents who were kind of moved into studios with kitchenettes, but I, I'm not sure how many of those are left. Wow. Well, you know, different living models for different eras and so forth. Yeah. So, yeah. One of the, I mean, it's really fun to read about um, what it takes to be a rocket, the rehearsal time, the dedication, you know, the lifestyle, living in the um with other women. I mean, it's sort of like a sorority house in a lot of ways, except, you know, yeah, for the arts. Um, but as you point out, it's really also about a woman in a, in a time of fair amount of restrictions, still trying to battle her way out of the expectations of father and fiance. Um, mm-hmm. And, and her own, I'm trying to remember, doesn't she have a sister who is a lot more conventional? Yes. Her sister's a secretary. Yes. Exactly. Right. So Mm -hmm. it's, you know, family expectations. How far do you want to alienate yourself from your family? But how how much are you going to let your family dictate um, who you are? Megan Abbott's new book, you might not have read it. Um, Not yet, no. Beware of the Woman. It asks two really interesting questions, which I think Miriam is addressing. One of which is, you know, do you really know the person you married or may marry? And she has to think about that. But the other critical question is, you know, what does a child owe a parent? Mm. And mm-hmm. how much does what a child owes a parent have, what kind of effect does that have on the child's other relationships? In other words, if you're married, you know, what do you owe your in-laws or your, um, you know, yeah. or your other family members, not necessarily in-laws, but what would you owe your own aunt and uncle or cousins or parents? And how much would that interfere with the dynamics of your of your marriage? I think COVID probably really tested that, don't you think? When people had to all of a sudden sort of merge together as family units where, where they yeah. had been separate before. Oh, definitely, definitely. And, you know, I think in, in the book, at least with Marion, she definitely has that conundrum with her own father. Right. Of- you know, down as things kind of progress in the book, you know, what do you, should you take care of someone who may have betrayed you? How, you know, what, what do you owe them? I think that is such a good question. And I think something that everybody grapples with, especially as your parents age and need taken care of for sure. Mm-hmm. Where's her mother in all this? Um, Mary's mother in the book has passed away. Right. So she, that's another issue is, you know, who was her mother? And that's something that she discovers over the course of the book. Who, who was this woman and does she want to emulate her or does she not want to avoid emulating her, you know, and, and secrets get revealed about the family dynamic that she didn't know previously. And that really affects her because she, she meets a a man named Peter during the course of the book. 
as they're kind of hunting. It's a bit of a thriller as they're trying to figure out who's been setting bombs off in New York City, believe it or not, based on a true bomber. And um, and so, you know, she has to decide in, in this relationship that she might want to undertake, what is her role and will she give up her independence? And, you know, again, what does she owe the person she's with? Absolutely. Man, I was going to bring up the bomber because there is a, um, I mean, in all of your books, you're really focusing on the land, you know, whatever the New York City landmark is. My my friend Linda Fairstein did so well, you know, previously writing yeah. about, you know, but there's almost an infinite number. In fact, there's a new one that cropped up. If you looked at this new, um, the recently renovated I think it's his, I can't remember the name of it. It was all over the Times and the Wall Street Journal a week or two ago. It's a Hispanic up um, in North, North, ah. the city, this beautiful museum and amazing artwork. And Oh, no, I'll have to check that out. Okay. Oh, yeah, no, I absolutely do. It's like the, I can't remember what it's called, the Hispanic. It's it's um, a Huntington. Okay. One of Huntington heirs had this great, um, his focus was on, um Latin American art and other things and he built this gorgeous place up there um and it, there are other cultural institutions connected with it and to store his art and now it's all been renovated although some of them have moved on to other locations but um yeah definitely look for it because I thought it was tailor-made for you yeah oh it sounds like it and and yeah you know I'm, I'm always looking for these iconic buildings and and the fun thing about Radio City was again looking at how it's changed over time because around the theater are seven floors of you know in the in the heyday when there were all these people working on that stage all the time you had things like you know dressing rooms and rehearsal halls there was a cafeteria there was a lounge there was a dormitory 26 bed dormitory for when the girls wanted to stay over overnight um you know they had a a, a movie premiere room where they could catch early shows there was like a poster department, a hat and shoe department. And then up on the roof, they would play wiffle ball and um, and and shuffleboard. And right. they would go up there all the time, you know, in between shows, much to the delight of all the workers and the skyscrapers nearby who, you know, loved watching them go on up there and, and goof around. And it just was this, you know, really marvelous building. And I was in it, you know, recently. And it's, it's so, it's like a maze. It's just this incredible space, but it's very different now. One of the few things that's left is the Roxy apartment, which was not an apartment, but an entertainment room for entertaining celebrities who came. And it has a guest book with everybody's names in it, like Walt Disney or, you know, Judy Garland. And it had these 20 foot high gold leaf ceiling and cherry paneled walls, just art deco to the max. And it's really, really stunning. I mean, behind the scenes is as beautiful as the lobby and the theater itself. It's gorgeous. Wow. Well, there's Carnegie Hall. There's the old Met. Yeah. Oh. Metropolitan Opera. They had moved to Lincoln Center by the time I could start commuting to New York to go to the opera, which I've done forever. Um, in fact, last time I was in New York, I paid something like $400 for a ticket to see, what was it I went to see? It was an amazing performance with Sanda Rafkowski. Um Wow. I know, but it was the only seat left, yeah. you know, so yeah. that's what it was. But um, I remember I remember all the hoopla when the new Met opened, but I've always been sad not to have gone to the old one. And Carnegie Hall, if I remember right, has had a pretty had a, a very strong renovation. Yeah, a very big one. And and that's an interesting book. I wrote a short story set at Carnegie Hall called um, A Wild Rose. Mm -hmm. And because as my research, I learned that there, when they built it, there were two floors of artist studios on the very top. Right. Where, you know, Marlon Brando lived there for a while. All these people came and went. And I thought that would be a perfect setting for, for a book, for sure. Yeah, it absolutely were. If you wanted to be literary, the old Scribner building, I don't know if you remember how gorgeous it was. You went in and it had that beautiful balcony with the wrought iron work. Now I'm I'm not even sure that exists, but I mean, that was a, a for sure glamour spot was to stop there. And oh Lord, it was yeah. so. Yeah, um, time moves on. And unfortunately, urban renewal is a constant thing, isn't it? It sure is. And, you know, you'd mentioned earlier about I'm known for kind of the dual timeline novels, and this is more 
like you said, in one timeline, yeah. just because I wanted to give myself a little bit of a challenge. And it is a bit more of a thriller. It's got romance and glamour, but there is this thriller element to it. And it just made sense to keep it mostly in 1956 with a few chapters set in 94 or 92 that's about a, a rocket looking yeah. back on her life just to kind of pull the story together. But that was a, a kind of a really fun challenge to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's a big story. So I don't know that you could have I me mean, unless you were going to write like a 400 page tome. Um, yeah, but why not? You know, why not change up your book some? Do you think that you are, um, you know, pretty much, I don't want to say tight because that's so unfair. Do you think your readers expectations are that you are going to write a book that is going to be looking at historical landmarks with some kind of a, you know, thread pulling it? forward. I mean, your library book I thought was fascinating. I had no idea that the NYPL actually had a residential department inside, apartment inside, yeah. for example. Um, you know, the Frick is undergoing renovation. So, you know, it's, I don't think they're changing the interior though, are they? I thought they were just sort of cleaning it up. They're adding us, the, the second floor will be open to the public, which is oh, wonderful. Cool. Yeah, yeah, it'll be great. And then they're adding in some more um, space kind of off to the side and to the back of it, which they needed for educational programs and, um, you know, book talks and, and exhibitions. Sure. I think it's going to be really wonderful. I'm excited to see it when they. When yeah, they I am too. I wanted to go and see the artwork in the Brutalist building on Madison. I I really wanted to go to Thriller Fest, but my husband had difficult surgery and I couldn't leave him. Oh, um, I'm but yeah. I was I was all set to do that. But, you know, there's the old Museum of Modern Art. And then my sister actually was responsible for the new one before she died. She was the assistant director of MoMA and, um, you know, put all that together. Um, and then there's the Morgan Library, which, of course, has phenomenal history. Although, you know, there has been at least one fairly recent book about Belle de Costa Green that Marie yeah, Benedict. Yeah, personal did. librarian by yeah. Victoria Christopher Marie and uh, Marie Benedict is a fantastic book. It is yeah. it's a wonderful book, but there, you know, that that's a, a specific and real person, but that doesn't mean that there isn't opportunities to do something with sure. Morgan. Um, I mean, he was a very colorful figure. Yeah. Oh my goodness, to say the least. The, and in fact, the, the next book that I'm working on now, because of course there's a lag time between turning mm -hmm. a book in and it coming out, is actually set at the Met Museum. Which oh, is wonderful. Yeah. So I just got back from a trip to Egypt to do some research, which was quite something. And so it's set in the museum in the 1970s from the point of view of an associate curator um, and then a, a, an assistant to the Met Gala, which is that big party of the year that they do every year. And that was under Diana Vreeland, um, who was right. the... The, I remember uh, all that. She used to have the soles of her shoes polished every day after she wore them. So, <laughs> you were, so was that the Temple of Dender? Are you bringing that in? The whole, the, I mean, yeah, I, you know, I have been to Egypt three times. Yes, you yes. Know, right. we're talking about that that. Yeah, because we could, we could do a whole slideshow thing. Uh, I know you have some involved. remarkable photos. Oh, it was, it's, yeah. it's just amazing seeing how old everything is. And and so my character, who's the curator, she it's it set partly in the 1930s when she was an archaeologist yeah. there, and then partly in the 70s. And it's about the two of these very different people teaming up to find a stolen artifact. And it's been so much fun to to work on. I love I it. Think I enjoy it. it. Yep, heist <laughs> novels are just so much fun. But the whole Egypt thing is just remarkable. And you know, your timing, your timing is good because if we're lucky, they might finally finish the new Egyptian museum out in Giza, because I have spent a day and a half or two days in the old Egyptian museum, which is right off Tahir Square, yes. and which had possibly the worst lighting for a museum I have ever seen. And so you know, crowded and, oh, and dusty. And yeah, um, but I mean, it's an old Victorian building. It probably was um, not quite so bad. And people's expectations were different when it opened. But um, last time I, I love this. Last time I was in Giza, I love saying that. Last <laughs> time I was in Giza, <laughs> sipping my coffee and watching the sunrise and the pyramids coming into shape, um, there was all kinds of construction because it's right up the road from yeah. the meeting house. Um, yeah. And they recently, but there, there are two things. This is where it gets complicated because they've moved 
the royal uh, mummies and so forth to one museum. It's not the same museum. And then I'm not sure what they're doing with the ship right by um, the Great Pyramid because the ship is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they're if they're going to incorporate it into this new museum or not. But I mean, you know, the whole the whole thing in the artwork, the, the world, this whole question about whether countries can actually take care. Of, yeah. You know, it's the Elgin marble question, yeah. the whole bit. And certainly it would have been true of Egypt. Um, and it's yeah. not true of Egypt. Egypt's finances are so rocky. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to ask yourself how, mm -hmm. how much damage could actually happen, you know, and, and does, mm -hmm. does the native thing trump the, um, the all the questions about right. who, who, conservation so, and yeah. preservation and, and, and yeah, the Met's been going through a huge um, mm -hmm. overhaul, uh, overhaul about that very idea is to you know, what do these objects, who, who do they belong to the country exactly. where they came from or the Met, you know, even if they were acquired legally, but a number of them were acquired illegally. And so yeah. they do need to be returned. So it's, it's a real tough question in the art world for sure. It's a big tough question. You know, the whole colonial, you know, recovering from colonial stuff, but you do have to worry that some of these treasures, I mean, you know, the whole bit about the Russian oligarch that bought whatever the legendary, was it a Da Vinci? And he's keeping it on his yacht, you yeah. know, which is like the worst place in the world to keep an ancient oil oh, painting. Art historians are going mad, I'm sure. Yeah. But you know, the idea for setting a book at the Met and again, this is the book that's coming down the road, um, was from reading an article in the New York Times about at one Met Gala, Kim Kardashian wore this all gold dress and she yep. stood next to this sarcophagus because it was all gold as well. And then the person who stole that sarcophagus complained to an undercover cop in Egypt about how he stole it and that's not fair. He never got paid. And so they were able to track it down and realize that it was acquired illegally. The stamps were all you know, forged. And, and in fact, this, this guy had stolen the mummy, stolen the sarcophagus, dumped the mummy in the Nile oh. and then sold this to, you know, the underground market where it ended up at the Met. And this was all from an Instagram photo of Kim Kardashian because she's so famous, <laughs> but it kind of goes to the, the question you're saying of, okay, how do we keep track of what's, you know, who's going to take better care of things and, and where do they really belong? Yeah, and if a guy, you know, was able to steal a sarcophagus and dump a mummy, you know, and all the rest of it, what kind of security or what kind of custodial? I remember, you know, being in the Hermitage, and um, it's it's right along the banks of the River Neva and so forth. And the windows, it was a hot summer day, and the windows were open, and the dust is blowing in, and all right across the whichever Da Vinci it is, Girl of the Urban or something like that, you know, and so there are questions. And some of these old buildings that, you know, have become mm -hmm. um, museums or hold these great collections, but were never built um, to really do a great job with that. You know, mm -hmm. the Met is upgraded and upgraded and upgraded. And, you know, we know so much more now about conservation than we mm -hmm. once did, but it's amazing to me how much stuff has survived um, you know, in, in adverse conditions. And, and and when you see like, there's that, that painting in um, Spain, I think, where there was this very, like from the middle ages, this painting on of Christ in the church and they took it and, and to fix it up. And it turned out, it just completely contorted the, the face on it. And it ended up just looking just laughable, you know, because whoever did that job was not qualified it's just awful to see, but it was fun in, in the book, in the spectacular, you know, speaking of heists and things is to bring in this thriller element, because when I was doing research into the 1950s in New York, where the book is set, I learned that this guy called the mad bomber had set bombs for 16 years, all over New York city in iconic buildings like grand central or Penn station, even the New York public library. And he set 33 bombs over 16 years and he injured 15 people, some very seriously, and the police just couldn't find him. And so 1956, when the book takes place, is right when the police were ramping up the search for this guy. And to do that, they reached out to a, a psychiatrist and asked him to read the letters that they'd been sent over the years. And it was the first instance of criminal profiling ever. Yeah. And the guy they asked to, to look at it was this psychiatrist named James Brussel. 
And he read all these letters and he said, he came up with this list. He said, it'll be 40 to 50, um, very methodical, not married, living with an older female relative. He'll be from Eastern Europe, Roman Catholic, it, more and more, all these things. And he said, finally, he'll, when you catch him, he'll be wearing a double-breasted suit and it will be buttoned. And needless to say, without giving anything away, the, the science of criminal profiling was born from this guy. And so I, I love that concept. So in my book, when I learned that the, the Mad Bomber hit Radio City Music Hall twice with bombs, I thought, okay, I can weave this into my story. So for very personal reasons, Marion gets caught up in the hunt for the Mad Bomber. And she teams up with a, a brilliant and kind of introverted psychiatrist named Peter to to hunt the guy down. And so I've changed some things in the book. For example, in, in the book, he's called the Big Apple Bomber. I had to change some things just to make the story fit. And I explain it really well in the author's note, kind of what's fact and what's fiction. But what's amazing is how much is fact. Um, and to just pull from these things that really happen and kind of add them to the scaffolding of the story. It was so much fun. But did you like the thriller elements? Yeah, yeah. Yes, you fun. did. Mm -hmm. Right. So are you tempted to incorporate more of them into your stories now that you've, you know, kind of stuck um, your thing in? You know, maybe a little bit, but not too much. Um, you know, it's fun to just kind of play around with with the format and, and the formula um, and, and to kind of incorporate things just so I don't get bored. So, you know, every book has a new challenge for me, which has been so much fun. So I think th there might be a little bit, but um, this was pretty you know, the hunt and like, it was fun to do a chase scene through Radio City Music Hall late at night. That kind of thing was just a hoot. <laughs> there, you know, there are different kinds of thrills um, or crime novels. For example, a heist novel is dramatically different than, you know, a serial killer or, a, um, you know, hunt for a bomber. There, there are all kinds of crimes, um, fraud and so forth, you know, so you can, you can generate extra suspense without getting into a rut. For yes, sure. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I know you're having a wonderful time doing this. Why, why did you, what inspired you to take on the idea of landmarks in the first place? You know, it wasn't something I consciously did. I, I wrote the first book about the Barbizon Hotel for Women just because I thought that would be an interesting book. And then when that was done, I was walking by the Dakota and thought, oh, that could be a really fun building to try and get into and to set a book there. And then I just realized, oh, this is a thing. And readers seem to like it. And I like snooping around old buildings. So it's fine with me. And then suddenly that is kind of the landmark series was born, but it really wasn't a conscious thing. And I hadn't, I didn't think, well, no one's done this before. I'll do this. It really was just, this is what I like to do. And I love old buildings and there's a story in every one. Absolutely true. And of course you live in Manhattan too. So, you know, in New York city, which gives you ample opportunity it's it'd be a lot harder to write your books in phoenix which is such a modern city we don't have a huge number of old buildings um right yes. you know, it may, maybe be interesting at some point you know to to do an architect and you could you could even kind of do a link to some because some yeah. of these architects built things in new york but in other places as well certainly oh, chicago yeah. has this phenomenal architecture and i think I think some of them probably also operated in New York. That might be a fun thing to do sometime. That would be really fun, especially because that kind of gilded age, 1920s, 1930s architecture, that whole, those eras are really interesting. And the the architects at the time were stars, you know. Or, sure. you know, yeah, I have lives like Frank Lloyd Wright, for example, which is, you know, a thriller all, all by itself. No, I mean, you know, it, it also... You know, America was was really changing a lot. You know, the First World War brought it much more into the um, global stage. Second World War certainly did. And many things reflect that, that, you know, we moved from a much more agrarian and much more internal society. Um, and so other influences. I mean, why is Washington, for example, more or less you know, federalist style or Greek buildings, or why are so many of our buildings classical when they yeah. could instead, you know, be like the prairie architecture. So there's a lot to work with in there. Yeah. Oh, sure. Oh, I find it fascinating. Yep. I do too. All right, Patrick, come and join us and see if we have any questions from the audience so that Fiona can make her deadline. 
Okay. Yeah, there are some good questions here um, and some nice comments. Uh, Susan says, uh, that is awesome that there was that level of love and support among the Rockettes rather than the element of competition. Um, similar to how many of the authors in the book community are so supportive of each other's books and publication and tour dates, which is nice. Um, her question is, let's see here. During the time period that this book takes place in, did the Rockettes share living spaces during their working years or did they live all over the city? Yeah, you know, some, if they lived nearby, would commute from their family homes. Some lived together in, in apartments or in, for example, the, the rehearsal club. Um, yeah, some bunked up together because that was easiest. It was it was a real mix of of what where they ended up doing and, and what they ended up, you know, staying at. And, and there were options in New York and, and some lived in the Barbizon Hotel, which is kind of cool. Uh, let's see. You may have addressed some of this, but... Um... Did you know the history of the Mad Bomber before you started research for this book, or did it, or did you uncover it while researching? Yeah, that's a great question. I had never heard of it, him, and no one I know has heard of him. There's maybe one person I've met who's in their 80s who lived in New York who nodded their head when I kind of mentioned it in passing. It, it's amazing how he just kind of was forgotten um, after he was caught. And it was a big deal when he was caught. It was a huge, it was in all the papers, you know, and the papers covered the, the hunt for him like crazy. And so, yeah, I'd never heard of it. And what I did was I was looking for, I think I was looking through the New York Times from the 1950s and just scanning headlines and, you know, getting a sense of what that time period was like. And that jumped out to me. It said that they caught the Mad Bomber in January of 1957. And I thought the Mad Bomber, <laughs> you know, who's that? and went down a rabbit hole and thought, okay, he's going to be in the book. So was the profile correct when they caught him? Exactly. Really? And the police, at the, yeah. And the police at first were very kind of skeptical as, as you can imagine, because no one had ever done that before. It was just unheard of. And, and the guy who did it, James Brussel in real life went on to um, teach all over the country and, and kind of, you know, spread it um, to the FBI and all over the place. So, it, but it started here in New York. Wow. There are a couple of fun comments about, uh, about, well, one of them, Robin says, I graduated in 1975 and we still had dress codes for both sexes. Our skirts could only be six inches above our knees when kneeling. Uh, that changed to our, uh, uh, then changed to our fingertip while standing. Guys had limits on their hair length and facial hair designs. And then uh, another lady chimes in with, I graduated in 1973. Uh, my yearbook shows the guys with no restrictions on hair length or facial hair, LOL. But the <laughs> girls had to follow the dress code. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Isn't that, it's so incredible. I think even the Rockettes at a certain point couldn't wear pants in the theater. They had to, you know, so if, if, if they were hungry and someone was wearing pants, some, the one wearing the skirt would run out to get the food. Let's see. Um, did any Rockettes also dance as Jackie Gleason's June Taylor dancers? Oh, I've never heard of that. Um, so not that I know of. That's so interesting. It's possible. I mean, yeah. maybe, that she might have recruited them because it wasn't so arduous. Maybe Rockettes who, you know, needed a slower pace might have joined another dance troupe like that. Sure. Yeah. June Taylor dancers. Wow, I'd forgotten all about that. I love this. There's another one I can go go find out about. That's great. Yeah. Uh, over on YouTube here, um, Nancy makes the point. She says there are still historic women only dorms in New York City like the Markle in West Village and St. Agnes in UWS. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's one, St. Agnes is just here. I'm on the Upper West Side and um, it's just a, a few blocks away. And then again, if you Google the rehearsal club, you'll come upon a website of the new rehearsal club that they've created. It's on West 34th Street. And it's uh, it's just wonderful. The New York Times did a huge article about it just barely a month ago. And again, it's a space where where women can go and get a great apartment for and not have to spend too much money. I think they have to audition to get in, though. Wow. Now, that is an interesting wrinkle. I love that. I mean, <laughs> rents being what they are in New York, if you could dance or whatever, sing your way into it. How wonderful. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, let's see here. Emma asks, um, let's see, so excited to read this. I've loved all your books. Do you think you'll use the primarily one narrator format again or return to dual timelines? And then she says, also, are there any landmarks on the horizon after the Met? Ah, you know, I the, the Met will be more dual timeline and two points of view again. So a, a little bit of a, a little change to that. Not exactly the way it has been in the past, but it, it will incorporate those. And um, yeah, you know, I don't think too far ahead, which is why when I get an email saying, you know, you should you should look at Radio City Music Hall, I'm pretty much up for it because I don't have a a list that I, you know, keep of, of places. It tends to be the minute I'm done with one book, I just start looking around and something falls into my lap so far, knock on wood. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I, there's so many places here in New York. I joke around that by the, you know, 18th book, I'll be doing the gas station on the corner of 11th Avenue or something. But I also think it'd be fun to go to London and do a book there and, you know, right off a trip to London and because, you know, talk about old buildings, right? There you could really uh, find something. You know what? Happen. You could do the cloisters and you could trace every one of those structures that Rockefeller brought over to create the cloisters. You mm -hmm. could trace it back in its home country. It's, there's a wonderful about? book that just came out last year called The Cloisters by, I think her name is Katie Hayes. Right. And but it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. So that she's, she's kind of covered the cloisters, but it was a very different kind of book. It was very a different, different book. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally think the cloisters is worth several books. There's I a agree. Lot. And I, I love the idea of taking the original buildings, right. And, and yeah. starting it there. I think that's a great idea. Absolutely. Not only that, but you know, Fort Tryon Park is really a fascinating um, place too, up on the block and the elevator, you know, just um, going up from the, the subway up to, or the train, you know, up, that's worth a, I mean, there's a lot of great stuff up there. Oh so, yeah. yeah, I won't run out anytime soon. No. Let's see, anything else here? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, question, uh, what, what books have you read and enjoyed lately? Oh, yeah, sure. So I just finished a book called Hedge by Jane Delury. Um, and it was just Gardens. published on Zibby Books. What's that? Gardens. Yes. And it's about a, a garden historian. Mm -hmm. So of course you can see why I like that. And it's a domestic drama, just beautifully written and a, a really gripping book. And then um, uh, Wendy Walker is a thriller writer and she has a book out tomorrow called What Remains. And that's a really fun, fast paced thriller, which I enjoyed. And then um, in terms of historical fiction, there's a book coming out by Nicola Harrison called um, Hotel Laguna. The Laguna Hotel, and it's it's about you know California and set in the fifties. It's just again, and it's post World War II. You know what do women do now that the war is over? What what should they do? Have, having you know worked and had fulfilling oh. careers, and so it, it addresses what you were talking about earlier, which is very very good. Yeah, that was a hard transition. Wendy Walker will be live at the Poison Pen on Wednesday night at seven o'clock with Allison Galen, who's taking over the Robert Parker, Sonny Randall series. So it'll be, I think, Patrick, I'm right. Isn't this Wendy's first actual visit to the bookstore? I think it is. I thought she was here once before, but I may be wrong. Maybe, or maybe well, you know, I'm not always there. So possibly I've forgotten, but well, how about that? I'm glad you enjoyed the book. I thought it was really interesting. It'll be, it'll be fun to, to compare it to the Sunny Randall. Anyway, Fiona needs to depart for another engagement. So once again, the spectacular. And once again, we do have this very cool insert with um, the woman who yeah. fired it and look at her there dancing. I mean, yes. I love it. it's so great. And then what's the back, Patrick? Right. There's um, some other, other material there. So I love the fact that we can offer you something a little more exciting. Um, yeah, thank, thank you for the partnership. It's just been wonderful. And thank you for, for everything you've done to support the it's book. It's a pleasure. Um, we might need to actually send you more books. I'll let you know because we're running down. But fortunately, it's a renewable resource, as is, the, <laughs> as is the insert. So next year, Egypt. I can hardly wait. Egypt and the Met. Oh. Yes, wow. we're going to have it. We'll have to we'll have to reserve a couple hours. <laughs> we're definitely going to have to do that. All right. Well, thank you very much, Fiona. Enjoy the rest of your publication week. And um, thank you all for joining us today. Bye. Thanks, everybody.